Instant Ralston and Regular Ralston, the hot whole wheat cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Commander Corey, at the controls of the Terra 5, pilots the ship close to a strange, disc-shaped object floating above the planet Venus. Cadet Happy is on the disc in a spacesuit, reporting to the commander by spaceophone. Can you make anything out of those instruments and controls, Happy? No, sir. They're nothing like you'd find in a spaceship or artificial satellite. And besides, they're not even connected. The disc seems to be defying gravity. Don't touch anything, Hap. These wires are just hanging loose. Looks like they've been yanked away from the... Hey, Commander, what's wrong? The disc is falling. Falling toward Venus. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting Space Patrol adventure... In the Claw of Venus. Hi, Space Patrollers. Captain Dick Tufeld here. You got a riddle for you this morning. You ready? Here goes. What can you see out of, but nobody can see in? The answer? Easy. The new sensational Monoview Outer Space Helmet. It's a whole foot high, slips on right over your head, and rests on your shoulders. Yes, sir, it's a neat, complete disguise. And wait till you get your first look through that special one-way eye plate. It's like magic. You're whisked right out of this world into a strange, purple, glowing planet. You see everything clear as day, but tinted with a weird purple glow. And what's more, the Monoview Outer Space Helmet has a gleaming red and jet black lightning flash hood. And swell, real-looking oxygen tanks and breathing tubes printed right on. But best of all, this helmet is yours for only 25 cents and a box top. Now, gang, here's how you get it. Just buy a box of good hot Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an instant or regular Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer is good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. And now, here's a special Space Patrol flash. Immediately following today's adventure, Commander Corey will announce the name of the grand prize winner in the Name the Planet Contest. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure in the Claw of Venus. Commander Corey's space battle cruiser, the Terra 5, skims low over the mountains of the planet Venus. Controlled by Cadet Happy, sensitive infrared beams reach through the heavy, dark mist to feel the shapes of the craggy peaks below. Toward the east, eerie blue flashes of lightning signal the approach of a storm. With his eyes on the viewscope screens and a bank of instruments, Buzz Corey threads the needle nose ship through its hazardous course. We're nearly there, Happy. The probe beam should be picking out Sharn's tower any minute now. Well, we sure got a break from that storm, sir. We'll be right on top of him before he knows we're coming. Unless one of his men tipped him off. But even if they did, he wouldn't have time to dispose of the stolen zolanite. I hope not. But to prove our case, we've got to find more than five pounds of zolanite on Sharn's premises. Five pounds? Well, a hundred pounds were stolen from Saturn. I know, but zolanite is so rare that the government knows the location of every bit of it. Not counting the stolen supply, of course. Well, then Sharn has five pounds of it legitimately. That's right. Well... Commander, isn't that a tower up there ahead on the side of the mountain? That's it, Hap. As we land, we'll not lose any time getting out of the ship. If Sharn does have the Zolanite, we're in for trouble. Near the summit of a mountain, Sharn's tower rises into the mist, dwarfing two squat stone buildings huddled at the base. In the top chamber of the tower, Gaston Sharn barks instructions to his assistant, Richard Durant. Durant, did you hear what I said? Uh, what was that, Sean? I said 10,000 volts. What's the matter with you today? Oh, it's that storm. I don't like working here in this kind of weather. It makes me nervous. Afraid of thunder. I thought you were supposed to be a scientist. It's not the thunder, it's the lightning. And here we are in this tower with all this apparatus. 10,000 volts, Mr. Durant, if you please. All right. 9250, 9500... Ninety-eight hundred. Look out! It's too much. I warn you, the circuit's overloaded. Well, put in a heavier coil. What's that? 
It's a spaceship. It's landing. I told you we'd get into trouble. How do you know we're in trouble? Look, it's a space patrol ship. The Zolanite. We'll have to hide it. How can we hide it? It's already inside an endurium shield welded to an endurium platform. A charm. What'll we do? Go down and meet them. Keep them out of the tower if possible and try to keep that guilty look off your face. They probably aren't looking for Zolanite anyway. But what if they are? I know my rights, Durant. You just keep your mouth shut and let me do the talk. Hurrying down to the living quarters in one of the low buildings adjoining the tower, Gaston Charn hastily spreads several technical books on a table and then settles himself in a chair in an attitude of leisurely concentration. A moment later, Durant greets Buzz and Happy and leads them into the study. Well, gentlemen, this is a welcome break in a monotonous day. Yes, sit down, won't you? No, thanks. Your name is Sharn, isn't it? Yes. And uh, you you must be Commander Corey by your insignia. Yes. I'll get right to the point, Sharn. I have a warrant from the Venus Justice Department authorizing a complete search of your premises. I'm afraid I don't understand, Commander. A search? What for? Sharn, a hundred pounds of Zolanite was stolen from the government freight depot at Saturn City. A hundred pounds? <laughs> well, I didn't know there was that much Zolanite in the universe. How much do you have here? Oh, uh, about five pounds. Happy. Hand me the Zolanite detector. Yes, sir. Here you are. Now, let's see what we can pick up. It's working all right, Commander. Of course it is. Five pounds of zolanite is enough to set up quite a reaction. It's true. It could be five pounds 20 feet away or a hundred pounds 400 feet away. How about it, Sean? Can you move 20 feet and produce your zolanite? Mm, perhaps the storm has some confusing effect on your detector. Very unlikely. Judging by the indicator, we'll find some zolanite up in your tower. Let's have a look. Cut the detector half. Come on, Sean. Very well, if you insist. You and Durant lead the way. Very well. Through this door, gentlemen. This corridor leads to the tower. Look out! I'm scared! Smoking rockets! Struck by lightning. I told you, I told you, John. Get a grip on yourself, Durant. You're not hurt. Yeah, if you'd been hit uh, by lightning, you wouldn't be able to brag about it. A bolt hit the tower, just like I said it would. Well, we're not hurt. We'll go up and investigate. No, no. The tower is damaged. What if the lightning strikes again? Commander. Uh, yes, Hap. That flash must have put the Zolanite detector out of commission. See? It isn't picking up a thing. That's strange. You didn't get a shock or a burn, did you? No, sir. You better not risk the elevator after that bolt. We'll use the stairs. I'll go first. Happy watch Durant and Sean. The lab is right through that door, Commander. Smoke and rockets. What happened to the roof? A bolt of lightning blasted out the whole top of the tower. Yeah, and it wrecked the floor, too. It's lucky it didn't collapse. I, I don't understand it. What do you mean, Durant? That huge endurium platform, it's disintegrated. Vanished just like it never existed. Hmm. The walls are seared, but there's hardly any trace of molten metal. Strange. Happy, try that detector again. Yes, sir. It's working, sir, but it's sure a low reading. It's probably picking up this small fragment of zolanite. Yes, that's zolanite, all right. Which proves that your detector is working, and in turn proves that I do not have the stolen hundred pounds of this stuff. Yeah, it looks like the lightning destroyed all our evidence, Commander. And in that case, I should appreciate it if you gentlemen would leave... So I may silently contemplate my tragic loss. All right, Sean. There's nothing I can do now but watch your step. Next time, it'll take more than a bolt of lightning to save you. Come on, Happy. Returning to their ship, Buzz and Happy head back to Venus City. Doggone it, sir. That storm couldn't have done Sean a bigger favor if it had it made to order. Space control, Venus City calling all spaceborne traffic using approach lane 3, level 7. Emergency warning. An unidentified object has been reported hovering at a distance of 17 DUs over Venus. Ships approaching in lane 3, level 7, use caution. This disc-shaped object last reported hovering over the following position. Get this, Happy. Yes, sir. Latitude 15 degrees, 23 minutes north. Longitude 97 degrees, 2 minutes, 15 seconds east. Altitude 17 DUs. Space control, Venus City out. I wonder what it is, Commander. Whatever it is, it should be removed. Have you checked its location on the chart, Happy? No, I'll have it in a second, sir. Uh, it's uh, just about here. Oh, that's right near us. Yes, sir. Turn on the space phone, Hap. Right. 
Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, calling Space Control, Venus City. Commander Corey to Space Control, Venus City. Space Control, Venus City, go ahead, Commander. I'm checking on your report of this unidentified object. What's being done to remove it from the space lane? Nothing as yet, Commander. Colonel Yeager is waiting for a report from Space Platform Observatory Number 2. They're trying to identify the object. You said it was disc-shaped. How big is it? About 20 feet in diameter and quite thin and flat. There's no sign of rocket power or any other force. It's been over that same position on Venus for more than an hour. It just seems to hang there. That's all the information I have, sir. All right, Space Control. Inform Colonel Yeager that I'm going to investigate this object. Corey out. All right, Hap, we'll have a close look at this thing. Get your spacesuit on in case we have to attach a line and tow it out of the space lane. Moments later, Buzz and Happy bring their spaceship close to a gleaming metal disk. They circle it at a velocity just high enough to counteract the gravity pull of the planet Venus, 17 DUs below them. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. It's not under power. There's no sign of any rocket burst. And it's certainly unmanned. Yeah, the disk is too thin for anything larger than a dog to be inside it. I wonder what that stuff is on top. Uh, some sort of electrical equipment, maybe? What's it connected to? See those cables dangling? Commander, uh, since I've got my space suit on, why can't I board that disc and examine it? Oh, well, all right, Hap, but watch your step. Skillfully, Buzz matches the velocity of his ship to that of the strange disc as Happy stands in the airlock with the outer hatch open. Carefully, Buzz maneuvers the Terra 5 closer to the disc. And Happy crosses over. I made it, sir. I'm on the disc. Remember, Hap, this isn't outer space. If you slip here, you go down. And 17 DUs is a long way to fall. I'll be careful, sir. I'll drop back so I can see you better through the nose port. Can you make anything out of it, Hap? Not yet. But somehow I get the feeling that this whole object is part of something else. What makes you think that? Well, the bolts and brackets on the disc. It looks like it had been fastened to something and pulled loose. And these controls, they're nothing like anything you'd find in a spaceship or artificial satellite. And besides, they're not even connected. Well, don't touch them, Hap. Never can tell. These wires are just hanging loose. It looks like they've been yanked away from... Hey, Commander, what's wrong with the ship? You're moving away. It isn't the ship, it's you. The disc is falling, falling toward Venus. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, Space Patrollers. Captain Tufeld again. Right now, I'm in the mail room at Space Patrol headquarters. You hear that? That's our stamping machine pounding away like mad. Just listen to those packages going down that mail chute. Man, oh man, it seems like just about every Space Patroller in the universe wants one of those terrific Monoview Outer Space helmets. There are hundreds, no, thousands of orders coming in. Say, how about you? Have you sent for your helmet yet? The one and only Outer Space helmet you can see out of, but nobody can see in. A wonderful helmet with honest-to-goodness-looking oxygen tanks and breathing tubes printed right on it. The sensational helmet with the gleaming lightning flash hood and specially constructed outer space ear plates. The helmet that's just like the one Commander Corey wears. Now, to get one, just buy a box of good hot Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents and an instant or regular Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol... Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Now, space patrollers, if you've already sent away for your Monoview Outer Space Helmet, you may have to wait a few extra days. You see, we've been getting so many orders, the Space Patrol mail room is swamped and working overtime to get them out. So you better hurry now, because this offer soon ends. Send for yours today. And remember, stand by, space patrollers, for the name of the grand prize winner in the Name the Planet contest in just a few minutes. <laughs> And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure in the Claw of Venus. Returning from the remote mountain laboratory of Gaston Shane, who was suspected of stealing a supply of rare, valuable minerals, Zolanite, Buzz and Happy rose high above the surface of Venus to investigate a strange disc-shaped object that unaccountably remained suspended over one position on Venus. Donning his spacesuit, Happy stepped from the airlock of the Terra 5 onto the disc to examine it. He touched a dangling piece of wire. There was a flash, and the disc sharply responded to gravity, falling toward Venus, carrying Happy with it. As Commander Corey hastily maneuvers the spaceship, Happy drops away with rapidly increasing velocity. Happy, can you hear me? Yes, Commander. I'm going to try to get you off that disc before you fall into the Venus atmosphere. Happy, how much space between you and the airlock? 
about 50 feet. Can we match velocity? Yes, sir. Uh, the ship and this disc are falling at the same rate. I'm going to pull over closer. Guide me. That's it, Commander. A little more. More. Hold it. I can reach the airlock now. Okay, climb aboard. I'm going to have to pull out of this trajectory, and I'm going to try to take the disc with us. Apply magnetic holding field. Yes, sir. It's in the field, sir. We've got it. I hope we can hold it on a sharp pullout. It's an awful strain on the hull of the ship. I'm afraid it's too late. It seems a shame to cut it loose. Check the infrared viewscope, Hap. See where the disc will land if it continues this trajectory. Yes, sir. Ah... Uh... It'll land in the Venus Sea, or along the coast, somewhere in the Gartoga Mountains. Commander, what's that? I just turned on the Zolanite detector. Something must be wrong. There's no Zolanite around... Hey, on the disc. Right. We'll try to make the disc land where we can recover it again. Cut magnetic holding field. We'll track it in the viewscope and see where it falls. Keep it centered, Hap, while I level off. Yes, sir. I don't get it, Commander. Zolanite out here on that disc? Well, how did it get there? Remember that hole in the roof of Sharn's Tower? Yeah, the lightning. Wouldn't you say that hole was the same size and shape as the disc? Why, yes. Then that disc was in Sharn's Tower. It's the Endurium platform Durant said was disintegrated. Oh, that's why we didn't see any molten metal. The whole platform shot up through the roof. But well, what made it stay suspended 17 DUs above Venus? The tremendous voltage in that bolt of lightning produced some peculiar effect on the Zolanite. And it nullified gravity. It's the only explanation. Maintain the momentum of Venus's rotation on its axis, but soared upward till it reached a point of equilibrium. A new force. Wow. Hey, think what that'll mean to space travel. Hey, we've got to recover that disk and, and have some experts check it. Yes, but first I want two particular experts to check it. The men that accidentally discovered this new force. Charn and Durant? Right. When they see the viewscope microfilm of that disk and learn where the object landed, I think they'll get just a little bit... Several hours later, Sharn and Durant sit watching the inner planet news telecast. announced the strange disc-shaped object that has been hovering over Venus has crashed. Mm, turn that up, Durant. Yes, yeah, Sharn. Sure. The pilot of a space patrol ship sent to investigate the gravity-defying disc reports that the object suddenly descended toward Venus, mm. landing on the coast of the Venus Sea in the Gartoga Mountain region. Because of the difficulty of recovering the object, the space patrol will delay further investigation for several days pending the arrival of a team of experts from Saturn. Now, here is a portion of viewscope microfilm taken from the space patrol ship sent to investigate the disk. Look, Durant, you recognize it? It's the Endurium platform from the lab. This is the mysterious object that now lies in the area known as the Claw of Venus. And now, items from the universe of sports. Cut it Today off. in Mercury Stadium... I've got to act quickly, Durant. What do you mean? We've got to get to the Claw of Venus and recover the Zolanite before those space patrol scientists get there. But sure. Don't I... argue. You realize we're the only ones in the universe who know that Zolanite can neutralize gravity? I don't like it. It's dangerous. Don't be a fool. We can control high voltages. Quick now. Get some cutting tools. Then we'll blast off for the Claw of Venus. Miles away, where huge breakers of the Venus Sea batter at the bluffs, a gleaming disk of endurium lies embedded in shattered rocks on the shore. In a small cave nearby, two men in space patrol uniforms wait patiently. I think they'll fall for it, Commander? I think they will, Happy. Not only to get the Zolanite back, but to protect themselves. Sean knows that if we find the Zolanite, we can prove this endurium platform came from his lab. I hope they come pretty quick. Tide's coming in. In a few hours, this will all be underwater, including the disk. Yeah. Hey, Commander, you hear that? It's a ship. Coming in for a landing on top of the bluff. It must be Sharn. From their vantage point in the cave, Buzz and Happy watch Sharn and Durant make their way down the steep cliff and start to work. What did we lug that electro welder down here for? When we get the Solonite out of the container, I want to seal things up a little, just to confuse the experts. Well, I'm in favor of getting the Zolanite and heading back to the ship. The experts will know this disk has been tempered, but just from the marks of the Atomo torch. They might think the metal was fused by air friction in the fall. After all, it dropped 17 to you. All right, Sean Durant, drop those tools. Corey! Uh, Happy, take Sean's blast gun. Yes, sir. And give me that Atomo torch, too, Sean. Why, of course. Here! Why, you... Slug them to 
Let's go with that torch. <laughs> Come on, Durant. Run for the cliff. Have we come this far? Let's finish them. I'm huh? still conscious. Corey's got his ray gun. Come on. Keep behind the rocks and run for the cliff. Halt! Stop where you are. Halt! We're safe. Up the cliff to the ship. You've still got your blast gun. We can pick them off. Then get this all tonight. Why use a blast gun on Corey and the cadet when we can get the same results another way? Halt! When we're past that first ledge, we'll blast the cliff with a gun. That'll leave Corey with a, a perpendicular wall to climb. Hurry, Durant. Keep after them, Happy. Yes, sir. I'm still dizzy from the crack in the head with that Atomo torch. But I bet I can outclimb those two rats any day. Happy Duck, Charm's aiming his blast gun. <laughs> Smoking rockets, Commander. Look what he did. He blasted that overhanging rock. And there's no handhold, no foothold. Just a sheer cliff. And there they go, the rats. Commander, what are we going to do? The tide's coming in. We can't scale the cliff, that's certain. In a few minutes, the waves will be smashing us back against the cliff. We don't have a chance. Wait, I think we do. A long chance, but it's worth a try. Come on, let's get to the disc. To the disc? Yes. Do you remember what you touched up there when the disc started to fall? Well, yes, sir. That broken wire dangling from the panel. I accidentally brushed it against the endurium, and there was a flash, and I felt like I was going down in a fast elevator. Apparently, you discharged electricity that was stored in the Zolanite circuit, a charge that made the Zolanite resist gravity. Now, if we could restore that charge, perhaps the disk would rise again. But, Commander, what can we charge it with? There's an electro-welder Sharn left behind. That generates considerable current. As much as a bolt of lightning? No, but perhaps we don't need that much. Well, it's worth a try. It'll mean taking the electro-welder apart with the Atomo torch and rewiring it to the connections on the disk. Let's get to work. Swiftly, Buzz and Happy work with the tools. Then, as the surf begins to surge around them, Buzz makes a final connection and they stand in the center of the Endurium disk. All right, Happy. Take it easy. Start the electro-weld generator. Very low at first. Nothing's happening, sir. Give it more voltage. Steady now. This takes hold suddenly. Maybe the circuit was wrecked when the disc landed on the rocks. Hey, it's beginning to move. I can feel it. Look, we're rising. Hold it, Happy. Hold it right there. We're a few inches off the ground. I'll get off and give the disc a shove toward the cliff. Then we can ride up the face of the cliff and jump off at the top. Hey, that's right. It wouldn't be much good to us if just suspended in empty air. It's hard to move, Hap. Why is that? It's weightless now. As far as Venus gravity is concerned, it's weightless, but it still has its mass and inertia. Now it's moving toward the cliff, sir. The inertia will carry it the rest of the way as we ascend. All right, Happy. Increase the voltage slightly. Here we go, sir. Hold us steady, Hap. We're rising fast enough. Well, we made it. Yes. I wonder if Corey's got his feet wet by now. Uh, let's walk down to the edge of the cliff a ways. We can't tell from here. All right. After all, we should shout goodbye before we blast off. Why shout? We're right here. Uh, no. Let's get him, Hap. It'll be a pleasure. <laughs> you think that'll take care of him? Frankly, I'm sorry. It's over so soon. I guess they don't have much fight left after that climb. Oh. How did you get up the cliff? On your gravity disk. You you worked the gravity disk? That's right, Sharon. Uh, the idea came to the commander like... Uh, like... Uh, like a flash of lightning. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure in just a moment. Smoking rockets, I must be getting space happy. I'm seeing double again. Hey, who are you guys anyway? A couple of twin giants from Jupiter or... Uh, or twin space pirates from Pluto? We can see you, Cadet Happy. Yeah, clear as day. Yeah, but I can't see you. Hmm. I know. Because you've got your Monoview outer space helmets on. Pretty neat, huh? Got oxygen tanks printed right on our helmets. And big red lightning flashes on the hood. Pretty keen? You betcha. More than a foot high. Covers up our whole heads. Nobody can tell who we are. Yep, you're real space patrollers, all right. Sure are. But jump in Jupiter, who are you anyway? Oh, come on, tell me. I'm Space Patroller Donnie Smith reporting, sir. Space Patroller Johnny Smith here, sir. <laughs> well, you guys sure had me fooled, that's for sure. And say, Space Patrollers, how about it? Why don't you send for your own swell new Monoview Outer Space Helmet? 
You know, you just buy a box of good hot Ralston, then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and the instant or regular Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis 1, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis 1, Missouri. Get going right away, today. And now, Space Patrollers, here's the big news. In just two seconds, Commander Corey will tell you the name of the grand prize winner in the Name the Planet contest. Commander Corey here. The name of the grand prize winner, the space patroller who wins my giant rocket clubhouse with a big motor truck to pull it and $1,500 cash is... Ricky Walker. Ricky Walker of 315 Wagner Street, Washington, Illinois. Congratulations, Ricky. And space patrollers, be sure you're listening next week for more exciting news about the winners of the Name the Planet contest. <laughs> And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. At the end of a secret cavern on Saturn's eighth moon, a strange spaceship waits for the precise instant to blast off. Buzz and Happy, helpless at the point of a deadly heat gun, are forced down the cavern toward the ship. Hurry up, both of you. There isn't much time. Listen to us, Zobanek. These people are creatures or whatever they are. They've got some hold over you. Sure, Zobanek. You'll be sorry the instant the ship blasts off. I know what I'm doing. You'll be sorry if you aren't aboard. You mean you'll use that heat gun on us? I won't have to. That's the first warning. If we're not aboard that ship in three minutes, we'll all be finished in that rocket blast. Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story, The Exiles from Denebola, when Instant Ralston and regular Ralston again present Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Devery. Other players were Norman Jolly, Ken Mayer, Bela Kovach, and Dick Beals. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Instant Ralston and regular Ralston again present Space Patrol! <laughs> This is Dick Tufeld in Los Angeles with the story of one of the fastest planes in the world and a word from the man who test flies it, Joe Lynch. It's North American's Air Force F-86D Sabre Jet Interceptor. Speed well over 700 miles per hour. Wingspan is 37 feet, length 41. Cruising range, 500 miles. Now by special tape recording made at International Airport, the well-known test pilot of the Sabre, Joe Lynch. The D is a one-man interceptor, so when you fly it, you're really on your own. That's why I see to it that I'm in good condition all the time. And one way to stay in good condition is by eating a good breakfast cereal, like rice checks or wheat checks. They're just packed full of energy, and they taste well. I think you'll like them, too. No other cereal, puffed or flaked, contains so much nourishment in such concentrated bite-sized form. So take a tip from Joe Lynch, George Welch, and other top test pilots. Make your cereals rice checks and wheat checks. <laughs> Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story in your local ABC television station. Consult your local newspaper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. <laughs>